scale change. Uh, my name's Helen Bevan and I'm from the NHS Institute for Innovation and Improvement and, and I'm your, your chair. And you know, I've had so many highlights. I think the last two days have been absolutely wonderful. But in terms of all the things that I have been looking forward to in this forum, I've been looking forward um, to this the most. And I've seen, I mean, the group of people that are going to present to you today, we've been rehearsing this since January, okay? <laughs> and, and what you'll see is, is a group of amazing um, leaders of large-scale change and improvers from all across the world. So we've been rehearsing together virtually via WebEx um, since January. And, you know, um, for some people it's been 10 o'clock at night, um, the, the people and um, colleagues from um, Denmark and Sweden, and um, for other colleagues um, from Australia and New Zealand, it's been like at the crack of dawn in the morning. And, and we've come together as an amazing community um, to, to build this session. Um, and um, um, I really have high expectations. I mean, no pressure <laughs> to our speakers. <laughs> so, my, my, what I'm going to do first of all is just set a little bit of context. And I'm going to be the only person who speaks in this session who doesn't do it um, Pachuchka style. And don't say cop out. <laughs> so... You know, we, um, I mean, in the last couple of days, we've had so many presentations, and many of them have been wonderful. But what I'd say is that, you know, when it comes to presenting, and particularly in pre um, presenting our improvement stories, often clarity and brevity are becoming endangered practices. And to me, this, oops, it's, this cartoon... Um, <laughs> You know, it really um, uh, shows that, you know, in a sense, 50 ways to make your presentation more exciting. Now let's walk through slide 67, 50 ways to make your presentation more exciting, and people in the room are falling asleep. So, you know, we are going to break the mould um, this morning, and, uh, and we are going to present Pachuchka style. And um, have any of you been to a Pachuchka presentation before? Okay. I, a few of you have, not many. Do you know, Pachuchka is sweeping the world, okay? It's a form of presentation that was started by, um, by some architects um, in Tokyo. And Pachuchka means chit-chat in, um, in, Japan, in, in, um, in Japanese. And basically, every one of our eight speakers um, has got a presentation. They've got 20 slides. And every 20 seconds, the slide will move forward and um, automatically, so it's auto-run. So each of our speakers is going to speak for exactly 6 minutes 40 seconds, and then they sit down. Okay. So, um, and the thing about Pachuchka, I'd say, is that um, th there's a lot of evidence that's growing about it. And what it shows is that audiences retain more from a 6 minute 40 second Pachuchka style presentation than they do from a 30 minute presentation. When you're a presenter, it is really hard work to create a Pachuchka style presentation because you have to think so hard, you know, and we use, lots of, we use lots of images, we have to really kind of boil our messages down and it takes a huge amount of, um, of, of preparation and I think you'll be able to see that. Now, Pachuchka nights happen all over the world, okay? They're, they're operating in more than 450 cities. And if you get the chance, find out about your city and go to Pachuchka night. I love to go to Pachuchka night in, in my city, which is Coventry, um, in, um, in England. And I've presented Pachuchka style about... Um, sorry, it's, what's, it's put me on Pachuchka style when it wasn't meant to, but it doesn't matter. I'll manage. Um, so... Um, what happens, you know, on a Pachuchka night is that, that people just get up and talk about anything. So I've um, spoken at Pachuchka night about, um, about people with dementia and antipsychotic <coughs> drugs alongside students talking about existentialism and um, a, a techie guy talking about the disadvantages of cloud technology. And, you know, it's amazing. And, and the other great thing about Pachuchka is even if the speakers are terrible, you know they're only going to speak for six <laughs> minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> And, you know, Pachuchka happens um, all over the world. So um, this is Pachuchka night in Hong Kong, okay? Huge number of people. Well, our Pachuchka night in Coventry, we usually get about 30, okay? And um, this is in Damascus. And, again, Pachuchka um, spreading across the Middle East. So that's a kind of introduction to Pachuchka. So what I also want to do is just introduce us to um, the other part, I think the really important part today, which is about content, 
So every one of our speakers, every one of our eight speakers from across the globe okay, is talking about their experiences, amazing experiences or as leaders of large-scale change. So what I wanted to do just before we start is to talk just, you know, what does that mean, large-scale change? So typically, when we look at it, we see three dimensions. Okay, the first one is pervasiveness, okay, which is, you know... Um, is it affecting the whole system or only part of the system? How pervasive is the change? The second one is around size. Okay? What's the size of the system that's experiencing the change? Is it large? You know, is, it, is it broad? And then the third one is depth. And what we mean by that is, is does the change make us think in fundamentally and different ways? And the thing about large-scale change, the further it goes along these three axes, the more large-scale the change. And what you'll see in these eight presentations this morning is, is quite a lot of variants, okay? Some of them are very deep. Others are less deep but highly pervasive. So what I've done is I've drawn um, the, the three um, dimensions over there um, on the flip chart. So, you know, when you're listening, have a think, you know, how pervasive, how deep, and, um, 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 and what's the size of the change? So we have our eight presenters from, um, from across the world um, who have volunteered um, and have spent a long time presenting and um, are going to be completely amazing. Okay? So, finally, <laughs> let's talk about the holy triad of great presentations. Okay? What do we know about really great presentations? Okay? They should be brief. They should be brilliant. <laughs> and then we should be gone. <laughs> Okay, so um, I hope we're going to just have the most amazing time. And do you know what's great now? With more and more people coming into the room, it's starting to look like Pachuchka night. You know, it's, it, it, it's starting to look like how Pachuchka um, should, should look. So um, um, let's, um, let's go for it. So, okay, our first um, speaker is John Wakefield. And John comes from um, Australia, from Queensland Health. So, um, John, come and join us. If you want to tell me when you're ready, yep. I'll start your slide. If you want to just say a few words first. Okay, thank you very much. A uh, lot of pressure. And just a couple of things that I want to share with you first, if I may. Of course. The first thing is um, I've learned about in this whole thing is when you, when you do a WebEx, put your shirt on, particularly if it's early in the morning. Um, the, uh, Helen? Yeah. Oh, no, no. He's a, the, um, <laughs> no, no. He's, got a, he's a fine specimen of a man. I mean, <laughs> The second, the, the second thing is my lasting impression of Paris. You know, I'd like to say it was the museums and the architecture and everything else, but you know what? It's how they park their cars. <laughs> Has anybody, can anybody figure out how they get them in and out? I, I just, it's amazing. But anyway, so... Um, Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Right, let's go for it. Okay, our first Pachuchka presentation. There you go. Okay, thank you. So... Um, yeah, my name is John Wakefield, and I come from Queensland. Actually, I come from Lancashire, but I, I'm, I, uh, I actually do work in Queensland. And I have the privilege of heading up the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Service there. This is a story of how you can fill your stadium, and how since 2003, we've been able to prevent 30,000 patients from suffering a pressure injury. Bed sores, decubitus ulcers, pressure ulcers, pressure injuries, they're all different names for the same thing, and obviously they're pretty shocking. In Australia alone, it's estimated that about 400,000 bed days are lost each year to this. And, you know, we don't look for these things. In half the cases, we don't even find them. This is the Gabba Stadium. This, this is going quick in 20 seconds. Um, <laughs> home of international cricket in Brisbane. Imagine if you could three quarters fill this stadium each year with people that you'd save from a pressure injury. We managed to do that, and, and I want to try and explain how over the next few minutes. But before I do this, I need to just orientate you. Um, as Helen said, I'm from Queensland, which is the best state in uh, Australia, <laughs> in the northeastern part. And you'll know it from the Barrier Reef, up the, the, uh, the World Heritage Barrier Reef, probably. It's seven times the size of the UK, hugely challenging to deliver, deliver health care there. And this work was all done in the public hospitals. But how did we do it? Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, there's no miracles in changing the practice of 30,000 clinicians. Uh, just a lot of hard work, a lot of persistence, and application of the basics of, of behavioural change theory. So let, let me explain a little more detail. 
In 2003, we started with a, a prevalence audit. We didn't do this. Uh, so I have to take, uh, accept the, uh, the, the credit from uh, a previous person who did this. So on 7,000 patients across the system, every inpatient bed, um, what we found was that 14% of our patients had pressure injuries. Now, this wasn't abstract research. These were our patients in our wards. The audit also identified that staff, they actually just didn't believe uh, in how important this was. They had low awareness of pressure injury as a problem uh, and the strategies and equipment needed to fix it. Um, and we just really had to tackle these beliefs and behaviours. So getting 30,000 nurses and doctors to change their practice, you know, it's not about the latest article in the BMJ. This is about their world. It's about their beliefs, what they see being modelled by their peers, what they value, and the consequences for them of their actions. The theory of planned behaviour really helped drive this. Having a goal was critical also to change. And after a lot of lobbying, we managed to get this as a key performance indicator for the, clinic, for the CEOs. And we, we created a target of 10% by 2011, so 12. And this, this had a profound impact on, uh, on buy-in. The bedside audit involves two auditors visiting every inpatient in a hospital across the state. It doesn't just provide rich data for clinicians that they value. This provide, it's a powerful intervention in its own right. And, and it really provides, it involves staff, patients, uh, and uh, the executive. Uh, another key component of the strategy uh, was the formation of, of what we call our pressure injury collaborative. Now this is jointly led by a doctor and a nurse, and now involves over a thousand of our staff across the state. And it's a very powerful way to get that sort of message out, the social marketing element of it. Behaviour change theory really does uh, include the, the use of levers, whether you like it or not. And we really focused on this and said, well, you know, what's in it for people? What are the carrots? So we introduced a pay for performance lever for involvement in the audits. Um, but we also managed to have the sticks there for, um, you know, if performance wasn't up to scratch, for example, for the CEOs. Our audit also identified a huge problem with mattress compliance. We had some terrible mattresses um, when you took the sheet off. So we, we got some money and we funded a replacement program for all the non-compliant mattresses across the whole state. Creating tension for change is, is useless if you don't have support for staff. So we, we obviously had a huge support, uh, uh, set of support tools and we did a road show which, which really got raised awareness and um, improved the knowledge of people out in the field. Another key element of this strategy was, was that we really needed to ensure that ward staff knew what was expected of them, that they could take responsibility for ward performance. Uh, and their own performance. Now we use Productive Ward, this is not an ad for Helen, but we use a product, Productive Ward and we found it very useful for this and other things. The, the, care, the performance is modelled and measured and, and displayed on the ward. Another advantage of taking, undertaking prevalence audits of this robustness is the ability to get high quality performance data. And I tell you what, when the negative, when the negative outliers see their results, they're motivated highly to change and we've seen significant turnarounds. So what have we been able to achieve with this strategy? Well, as you can see from this slide, we've managed over three years to move from 14% hospital acquired pressure injury prevalence to 7.9%. We've busted our 10% target. The real story, the real story here though is a human one. And these, these numbers don't tell the full story. This equates to almost 30,000 patients each year that no longer get a pressure injury now that used to. And when you, uh, if you focus that a different way, that's uh, operating and funding a completely new 316 bed hospital. Whilst there are many prongs to this strategy, I'd like the, the key message here is the beds, bedside audit. Um, you can't change practice crunching data in the back office. We all know that. You've got to get to the bedside, you've got to observe, you've got to measure, you've got to model. Finally, I'd like to dedicate this uh, presentation to Lisa Cox. There's a young woman that suffered a lot, but she's really helped us in, in uh, uh, educating our professionals. I'd like to thank my team, the collaborative, all the staff across Queensland Health, for this is their achievement, not mine. 
and you too can fill your stadium. Thank you. What a fantastic start. And, you know, when you look at our model of large-scale change there, I mean, it's kind of... John, it's got everything. You know, it's, um, you know, the, the, the pervasiveness, the depth in terms of changing um, attitudes and also the, um, the, you know, the sheer size of it. That was absolutely fantastic. So what we're going to do now is we're going to whip, like, halfway to the other side of the globe, to Scotland. So we're going to ask um, Jason Leach now to... Uh, to, to come and tell us, tell us um, your story, um, Jason. So just before I get you going with your first slide with your 20 seconds, is there anything you'd like to say? No. No? Great. <laughs> <laughs> the floor's yours. Welcome, everybody. I'm Jason Leach. I'm the clinical lead for the Quality Unit in the Scottish Government. I want to talk to you about large-scale change in a slightly different way. I want you to think of it deconstructed. On the right-hand side, the left-hand side of your screen is fish and chips. On the right-hand side of your screen is the same constituents in a three Michelin-starred restaurant. <laughs> fish, and, fish and chips deconstructed. And we're going to do that for large-scale change. And I'm going to do it using this. This is NHS Scotland. This is not actually what it looks like. It's not actually that colour. That's the regional delivery system providing the health care to 5.5 million people in the Scottish healthcare system. £12 billion a year. 14 clinical delivery systems. But we have problems, problems like your problems. This is one of the most high profile. In fact, we killed 14 people from C. diff in a Glasgow hospital. There's now a massive public inquiry, a big political priority to reduce that C. difficile infection, along with many other elements of harm. And you'll have your own veil of leaving hospital in your environment. So what, what do you do? Well, Genghis Khan was alive, there was no paper. So nobody wrote down these quotes. So I think they're for the purposes of presenters rather than for the purposes of anything else. But Gen Gen Genghis, my friend Genghis, is correct. Conquering the world on horseback is easy. It is dismounting and governing that is hard. So you have choices. What should you do? What should the policy options be inside the Scottish Government to fix that challenge? Should we just keep sending letters out and hoping for the best? Should we let the delivery system do what it wants? Or should we publish a national quality strategy and run a mandatory improvement programme? You may not be surprised to hear that that's exactly what we did. This is the quality strategy. This is the NHS's policy document to guide quality across the nation. You see the aims, more ambitions than aims, to deliver the highest quality healthcare services to the people of Scotland. And then we needed an, a, an exhibition project. We needed a prototype that we could prove quality worked. This is it. This is the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, with the aim of reducing mortality by 15% in five years, in partnership with IHI. That's an enormous aim. It's unachievable by normal mechanisms. It's an aim, the first element of our deconstruction. So remember, this is the deconstruction of large-scale change. But that's not the only thing you have to do. How do you take that aim and deliver it? How do you take the evidence-based changes and apply them at scale across a nation, across a system for five and a half million people? If you use conventional mechanisms, it takes you nearly 20 years to get just over 10% of that into practice. So you have to do something different. I'm going to explain what we did in a second, but first of all, let me show you what happened. Just very briefly, this is central line infections, gone in Scotland's intensive care units. 21 intensive care units, 19 of whom haven't had one for a year. Three months in Scotland with no central line infections at all. <laughs> Don't clap, it wastes my 20 seconds. <laughs> This is multidisciplinary rounds and daily goals in our 21 intensive care units. That's a 19% improvement of people talking together on a round at the same time. Those of you at Maureen's talk will have seen that same slide in Maureen's plenary earlier in the week. That, though, leads to something. It leads to a focus on process and outcome. This is a single hospital. This is the Stirling Royal Intensive Care Unit. This is process at the top. Outcome at the bottom. Each bar is a single pneumonia. The pneumonias are gone. The pneumonias are gone because the process is reliable. That collected together across the whole nation delivers massive transformational change at scale. So that's a near 10% reduction in hospital standardised mortality. That's number of deaths over number of expected deaths. 
a ratio. If we had the same care we had five years ago, that line would be straight. This is another way of looking at the same thing. This is all the operations in Scotland, whether you live or die. Half a million people a year, roughly, have an operation in Scotland. And for 20 years, the mortality was around 1%. You can now see three dots outside the control limits on the right-hand side of the graph showing dramatic change. So what's the second part of our deconstruction? Deming said you needed a method. Here's the method. The method is unimportant. The fact there is a method is what's important. That happens to be our method. It won't fit your context, but it's a method. So now we have an aim of 15% reduction. Now we have a method which for us was the Breakthrough Series Collaborative with measures and changes. And what's the third element of that deconstruction? So you need an aim, you need a model, but somebody's going to have to put the bed at 30 degrees. Somebody's going to have to do the medicine's reconciliation, and that requires testing, the third element of our deconstruction. Test and test and test again. But I have a new challenge, and the new challenge is to take that deconstruction and apply it to care, not technical change. So how do I make care reliable? And that's the Picker Institute's moving from never events to always events. What will we always do for patients? And I'm going to illustrate that with a patient story. I want you to meet Stuart. Stuart is an intensive care patient in that same hospital where I showed you the VAP. This is his nurse. She's filling in daily goals for him, asking him what he wants that day to do. Stuart said, I want to see my dog. <laughs> That's a challenge, particularly for infection control. But here's what we did. We took him to the front door of his hospital and we brought his dog to him. We told the dog not to lick his tracheostomy. We <laughs> We told the dog not to pull his cannula out. It's a very well-trained Labrador. But you can see the healing in the man's face compared to getting his antibiotics. I think this single moment means more to him than anything else. So what's the aim for your institution, for your context? Is this it? <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's really going to change the world. So I don't think you've, you've, you've come to this conference because you want adequate yearly progress. I think you've come here because you want an aim, you want a method, and you want to start that one small test. So when you go home, in your context, what is it that you're going to do at scale? And what are the elements you're going to have to put in place to do that at scale? Thank you for listening. You'd never think that they'd never done Pachuchka before, would you? I think um, you're a natural, and again, wonderful story. And, and, and I think when we you know, listen to both those, um, the first two presentations, just how much kind of resonance there is around how we make change happen at, at scale and pace. So our next speaker is David Galler, and David comes from Koatea in New Zealand. So we've, we've whipped one way across the world and we're whipping back again. David, would you like to say anything before we start? Um, a friend of mine said, if you don't love Paris, you don't love life. Um, who loves life? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd just like to say, okay, now look, I think we should Are you probably, ready? I think, okay, I, I, think I am it. ready. Okay, go, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa ki ora. Um, I'm also an intensive care specialist, um, but this is not a story about intensive care. It's a story about a mental health service on the move. Um, it's, a, it's a story that was until recently not very well known, but now is providing a beacon for the future for other health services. It's a story about a small group of inspired and willing people who, when faced with a crisis in their service, took a different course. Uh, with new ideas um, and have radically changed the lives of thousands of mental health care patients in South Auckland since that time. But before we get there, an introduction, New Zealand, you know it well, uh, a country unencumbered by the inertia of history, good and bad things happen fast. Women the vote, good, 1893. Social welfare system, good, 1935. The very, very ugly side of uh, Thatcherism in the 1990s, bad, 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 bad. <laughs> uh, you know, so there you go. Now this is my place, uh, uh, Counties Monaco. Uh, we're a high-performing district health board, I have to say, renowned for good leadership and innovation, and we look after 500,000 people, many of them Polynesian, Māori and Asian, it's a low socio-economic part of uh, the country and it comes with problems, many of them, and you'll all know what those problems are. In New Zealand every year, 
16 million community consultations, 700,000 hospital discharges. People live their lives in the community. This is not a story about primary care. It's not a story about secondary care. It's a story about a system of care. That's the story I'm going to tell you. And we've been influenced by my friend, not my friend, the renowned sociologist Manuel Castells, who has described the context in which 21st century healthcare will take place. The success of individuals, teams, organizations, systems, and indeed nations relies on its citizens. On systems, on culture, on technology, and managing knowledge as, as if it was money. And my good friend Muir Gray, in 1983, published in The Lancet an article called Four Box Healthcare. With his permission, I have changed it somewhat, and I've put him on the stick man, a system of care. Wherever you are in the system, aspects of self-care, generalist care, um, uh, uh, community care, generalist care, or specialist care can be available wherever you are. The story itself, though, begins in 2002, a service in crisis, acute beds full, the uh, uh, community uh, overwhelmed with work, uh, a constant clamour for more beds, no morale or trust in the system. The service needed a game-breaker, and that game-breaker arrived. It arrived in the form of some very good people who, instead of giving in to the clamour for more beds, started to engage much more closely with patients, their families, and their staff to try and understand the causes of their frustrations. Uh, they made a project plan, they mapped out their system, they looked at their areas of constraint, and they communicated the need for change and the benefits it would bring. They invested across the whole of the system to better inpatient care, more safe and effective discharges, and keeping people well out in the community. They became renowned for genuine consultation and a real interest in listening to other people's points of view. And with that came the possibility to do so much more. It was rather incredible. Critical to their success, um, Luxembourg Fountain, L Luxembourg uh, Gardens, you must go, uh, was the institution of four multidisciplinary locality-based teams and teams for Māori and Pacific. They partnered with NGO consortia who provided other services and were supported by peer support workers, uh, ex-mental health care patients or current ones who helped. Under close clinical governance, um, they worked um, very closely. They looked, after the, they looked after the care of all of the patients wherever they were in the system. And they had access to all the resources, all the people skills that they needed. Most of that was in the home, actually, to tell you the truth, but actually they also had an aliquot of inpatient beds, and they created this, they, they were their own gatekeepers, and they created this community pool. Every patient has a caseworker, a case manager, who gets to know them, understands them and their family, um, uh, can manipulate and adjust and coordinate the management plan, uh, and can intervene early through triggers and tools if there's a social or a clinical deterioration. You know, it's a wonderful system, and it's reduced uh, lots of problems. I'm an intensive care specialist, actually. You know, so we're intensive care providers, but we're intensive care brokers. How nice it is to actually have someone who gives a fuck about the whole patient. You know, <laughs> and that's that fabulous instead of the sods, the single organ doctors you're constantly dealing with, the fragmented, <laughs> fragmented stroboscopic care that most people get. The employment of these peer support workers has been amazing. It's given us incredible insights into uh, how we can better deal with uh, patients and their families in the community, particularly Māori and Pacific uh, families, and how we can make them more independent uh, and much more productive in their own communities. It's been a wonderful lesson for us. Does it work? Well, yes, it does work. It works every time, doesn't it? Just look at it. You know, it works. You know. And the people who have been involved in this have seen how a system of care can be developed and they can see the benefits of a system of care and have willingly given up so much of their own personal agendas for the system and for the people and for the benefits that are there. So does it work? Yes, it works. Objective and subjective data across all domains of the triple aim uh, have proven to us that this is good. This works. You know, we've got better population health, we're containing costs, and personal care has dramatically improved. We've got objective evidence of that through uh, a range of measures that have been benchmarked around the country uh, uh, against our other um, uh, mental health services in New Zealand around you know, average length of stay, readmission rates, you know, satisfaction surveys, a whole range of different measures that have shown that this really works for people. It's a great success. Um, so we've arrived at a better place, and we've got here, you know, through quite a lot of hard work, vision, leadership, engagement, a willingness to listen, 
uh, rigorous measurement and evaluation, small tests of change, uh, and at the end of it, at the, but surrounding it is the, is the patient. So I think we've got a little gem here. This is an example that we are now using to re-look at all of our services. And, and what it points to is that, you know, even Hillary climbed Mount Everest, you know, great guy's a beekeeper. He's an ordinary guy. He did an extraordinary thing, you know, and that's what we've seen with this service. So thank you very much. Wow. So, um, again, I think the, you know, the kind of the theme that's developing is, you know, all three of our speakers so far have talked about truly large-scale change, you know, change of, of, of great size, of great depth, and that is pervasive. And yet, at the heart of that is about the individual. You know, it's about the, every patient, every person that uses our, our services. So we can't think about scale without thinking about the, the person. So I'm getting a bit exhausted with all the travel because, you know, we started, in, um, we started in Australia, then we came back to Scotland, then we went back to New Zealand. So now we're coming right back to Europe again. And I'm, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, who is Beth Lilja, and Beth runs the Danish Patient Safety um, Society. So, um, Beth, would you, would you like to say anything before you start? Well, I'd just like to get it over with, to yeah. be honest. <laughs> Okay, you ready? I am. <laughs> Go. So, who is healthcare for? Is it for the doctors? Is it for the nurses? For the administrators? If healthcare truly were for the patients, would we then let them wait for us most of the time, telling that, that our time is so much more important? Would we have separate bathrooms, separate restrooms for patients, separate cantinas, and so on? If healthcare truly were for the patients, we would not only welcome them, but also their relatives, their families, whoever they choose to support them. But can we say that that's what we are doing? Well, in the Danish Society for Patient Safety, we think that we need a transformation, and we think we need that transformation as soon as possible. We want a major change that can be noticed by the youngest nurse and by the oldest patient. So what we did was that we started different kinds of campaigns that are designed to make humans uh, change behavior. And we found out that campaigns actually have very little impact on the ways that we change the way that we usually do. Uh, it doesn't make us stop smoking. It doesn't make us exercise more. They don't make us eat less salt. But what we found was that campaigns were extremely good at getting acceptance to put structural uh, changes in place. Uh, campaigns, uh, it would have been impossible to pass legislation uh, for anti-smoking if we did not have campaigns uh, that tells us that smoking was uh, unhealthy. Campaigns are needed in order to clear the way for structural changes. We also looked at other major changes in the healthcare system. For instance, the introduction of men into the delivery rooms. Uh, hardly any children today are born without the father present in the room, a situation that was unthinkable about 40 years ago. This change did not take place as a result of an invitation from the obstetricians or from the midwives. On the contrary, they were horrified. They said couples were never able to resume their sexual life if the man was present, or how will we deal with an emergency situation when the man is there? So the pressure that actually forced the change in the delivery rooms came from the women, from their companions, and most of all from the women's liberation movement. That's the single most important factor. Likewise, the gay movement, at least in the U.S., uh, are uh, responsible for the decrease in time it takes now to uh, approve new medication. They wanted to have access to HIV medications, and they were successful in their campaigns for that. That made structural changes as well. So in the Danish Society for Patient Safety, we have a patient empowerment program with tools both for the patients and for the healthcare system. But in order to make healthcare a safer place, empowered patient, and in order to make healthcare a safer place, empowered patients are one of the uh, major keys for that. But why not try to get help from their relatives? So we added a 
uh, relative empowerment strategy. Most of us have close ones uh, that are sick when we ourselves are powerful and energetic and healthy and we are able to, uh, to uh, do things. So we thought that why not ask the relatives to invite themselves into the healthcare system, put a pressure on the healthcare system. So four days in December, we went to four different railroad stations early in the morning until late in the evening to communicate with uh, the commuters by handing them a t-shirt like this. Um, and, we, and we asked them um, to invite themselves into the healthcare system. We also uh, identified the roles as other sister, son, a better hair, a daughter, and so on, and a relative. So we got these sports stars and uh, actors well-known in Denmark to help us wearing the T-shirts on posters and be present at the railroad stations. Also, our health minister, a young woman, gave a hand handing out T-shirts while she was having a dialogue with the commuters. This, together with the actors and the sports stars, created a lot of press. And we needed that press in order to spread our message. So the logistics were very challenging. Uh, but we managed to get a lot of students to help us, medical students, nurse students, other students. Uh, they received a couple of hours just in time training and they were ready for the dialogue and they did a perfect job. So the message that we are having on these t-shirts, they are printed at the laund as the laundry instructions in the back and uh, it's very simple, join and be a support, ask if in doubt, keep track of the medications. It's not really about these messages. It's about allowing the relatives to be part of their close one's health care. Uh, we had more than 40,000 personal dialogues in these four days, equivalent of a dialogue with one out of 125 days. 90% uh, of the people that passed the railroads noticed our campaign, measured by exit polls. Most of them found that our message was relevant for them. And um, due to the enormous press coverage, we were able to make a survey or a random sample of Danes, and we asked them whether they noticed the campaign, which 38% uh, <clears throat> did. 6% were able to reproduce who was behind detailed uh, things, and 70% had intentions to act differently in the future. So after this initial success, and in order to keep putting the external pressure on the healthcare system, we will continue to campaign. We are now planning fall events. We are refining our message. Our plan is right now to travel from city to city and be present in shopping malls and hospital uh, halls, etc. And we are aware that the campaign will not overnight change the healthcare system, but we have no doubt that within a short time there will be structural changes, no restrictions in visiting hours, no restrictions in what examinations you can be present to if you have a close one there. And uh, that will all together make healthcare a better and safer place. Thank you. Oh, do you know, it's, I know my expectations were high, but um, this is turning out just as I wanted it or even better. So, um, so that's great. And you know, Beth, what I'd say is, again, when we think about the spirit of large-scale change, you know, at the heart of that is, is mobilising, building a social movement. And the thing about, about mobilising and building social movements, it doesn't just happen. You know, it takes a huge amount of organising, and I think you're a wonderful example of that. So that was, that was terrific. Oh, I'm glad to say, we're, like, travel-wise, it's going to be a little bit easier next because we're going to stay in, in, um, in Scandinavia. So um, our next um, presentation is from, is from Joran, Joran Hendricks from Young Shipping. So um, Joran, do you want to say anything before we start? <laughs> <laughs> this is about fall prevention. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to start? Uh, Are you ready? I think so. You sure? I'm sure. Okay, have I just done the wrong one? Ah, that's Danish. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I thought you were going to do the Danish one. Then. Yeah, I'd love to do that because the Danish one talked about what I'm going to talk about, right. about walk out and walk on. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> so uh, this is about improving elderly care in a, in a country and the mission to make everyone to walk out and walk on. 
but it's also about the nurses and the assistant nurses and the tribute to them, how fantastic work they do for all our elderly. I will try to describe for you how we can increase better value for the elderly in mouth health, fall prevention, ulcers, and uh, nutri nutrition <coughs> risk. And the things we have done is that we have tried to innovate daily work. We have tried to do it in large scale directly. And it is a real revolution in care prevention. And we have used also measures that we call senior alert. It's a prevention because it decreases the risk. It's an evolution because it's together with everybody and it's a revolution. Now, this is how it was when things should be changed. 1601, James Lancaster found that it was hard to keep the semen healthy. Have you any idea how long it took before the, all the sailors got use? It took 195 years to get use in, instead of getting use directly because they had to scientifically prove why it was important. And you can read about this. 1601, the Lancaster found it. 1796, lemon use was officially introduced. And 1865, the British Board of Trade adopted the policy. I have another question. How long did it take for NIH to t recommend the treatment of ulcers, as suggested by Dr. Marshall in 1984? Two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years. What do you think? No, it was 10 years, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, we thought we should challenge this. We should spread into the whole country a new way of working in five years. So we really, really searched for the tools. So we started to map the country, just as the Scottish did, and we tried to see from 2008 to 2012, could we cover the whole country with the ambition to change the care for the elderly? And now we have 20 of 21 systems involved and all the municipalities except two. What were the secrets? Well, we got governmental support that gave us accountability and they also gave us resources for the infrastructure. And then, of course, the idea of walk out and walk on and get people on. The work of care prevention. Where, and this is the process, the patient's process. We meet the patient, do risk assessment, do a team-based analyze, we plan actions and we evaluate. And we do it in these four things at the same time. And we do not do it in tunnels. You know, very often it's one nurse who do one thing and another nurse do another thing. How have we accelerated the use of quality readiness and patients' perspective of value? Well, we have found people that see that it's not enough what we do now, so we try to make tension for change and leave the idea to take one patient and at a time, support with measures, go from focus on diagnose to see what is possible in the indicators, and then invest in coaches that went out and talked and talked and walked and walked and showed the measures and help the people to evaluate their own performance. And what have happened? Well, from 2008 to 2012, we have had an in incredible journey together with all the nurses and assistant nurses in the country. Here we got the governmental support and the accountability bit to do this work. Is it important? Yes. S more than 65% of all patients have risk for falls, more than 60% of the patient has risk for malnutrition, and more than 25% uh, have uh, risk for pressure ulcers. And you know when the team see that they are not alone, we have a country that is in, on a movement that registers the work, something happens. 
And it's a very simple tool we use. We use individual scorecard. So here you see the patients. Here you see the questions. Is there a risk or not? Is there a preventive care plan in place? And do we measure the results? And suddenly people understand. And what can we achieve then? When here you see the reported faults in the primary health care center, and you can see how the fault falls uh, goes down and the teams feel encouraged. Here is about weight change, but the opposite way. So here is the increase of weight, and here is no weight change at all. And this gets uh, the teams going. And here is about the understanding of the comparison of length of stay in, at the medical department and risk for malnutrition, malnutrition. And that we see that there are many patients that are in risk for malnutrition and have a low BMI. How have we achieved all this? Well, it's not one method. It's consulting, training, sharing, breakthrough series, collaborative, wave sequences, and campaign model at the same time. And I think that that is also a very important lesson for us. But most of all, it is a question of having a whole picture, using value compass and think quality improvement and performance measurement at the same time. And with that, an infrastructure for quality registration in patient process develops. And most of all, now I'd like to thank the people who have done this work. It's Joachim Edvinson, it is Jesper Ekberg, it's Susanne, and it's Adam. Thank you very much. So, you know, I think this morning what our presenters are showing us is that many of the myths around large-scale change um, you know, can be busted. It doesn't have to take a long time. Most of it doesn't have to fail. We can mobilise people um, you know, with, the, with the right kind of goals, and, um, and I think Joran showed that really well. So, um, where are we going now? Well, um, we're, um, we're, we've got a, a bit of a journey, actually, from, uh, from um, Sweden, but we're going the other way now. Okay? We're going to Canada. So, very happy to um, introduce Christina Krauss, who is a leader of quality improvement in, um, in British Columbia. So, come on up, Christina, and um, would you like to say anything before you start? Um, no, I, I, I have a cold, so um, if I'm not speaking loud enough, please tell me, because I can't actually hear what I'm saying. So, um, <laughs> hopefully I'll speak okay. Okay, I've just done John's. I'm not going to do John's no, either, I no. I don't know. Anything. Sorry about this. It's so, it's so sensitive. This thing, you just touch it and it seems like a lot, doesn't it, when you're on? Yeah. Yeah, here we go, Christina. All right. Okay. All right. So this is where I actually spent a lot of my time growing up. Um, not because I was sick, but because my dad was a community pediatrician. And uh, he often took me there when he was doing rounds or seeing a patient. So I felt very comfortable in hospitals. But this wasn't actually the reason I went into healthcare. I went into healthcare because when I was 16 years old, both of my parents became sick. In a two-week period, my dad went on the lung transplant list resulting from a genetic condition and my mom was diagnosed with stage 4 breast cancer. There were times when they were phoning each other from their respective ICUs in two different cities. And during my dad's care, he actually experienced three preventable adverse events. And the biggest thing that stuck with me from his experiences was how he was actually treated. As a physician, he was keen to be a colleague and to be really involved in his care. And yet we often heard, you be the patient and I'll be the doctor. Even though each of those three times in those adverse events, he was the one who actually did, diagnosed what was going on in his care, we still heard, you don't need to know the information on your test results. That's for us to know. These experiences are the roots of the passion and dedication I have to improving healthcare. And it's this, from this foundation um, from which I work, um, both, uh, from both how my parents were uh, treated in the health system. And what I learned is that we need to be deliberate in how we engage and how we partner and create uh, shared leadership. 
In British Columbia, where I work with the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council, our organization is dedicated to supporting improvements in care, and our approach around supporting large-scale change is also built on this foundation. It's on the premise of distributed leadership to enable us to improve care at the scale and pace that's required. We see ourselves as community developers, engaging and scaling up large numbers of people. We're doing this across multiple levels in the organization, and we brought together leaders across the province to build their capability and capacity to lead change. And through this network, we're starting to see not only greater action, but a stronger sense of ownership in the system um, outside of traditional quality departments. This shift, this idea that everyone is responsible for improving quality of care is key. So often when we've had outbreaks on a unit, people have looked to infection control and said, well, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix this? Rather than saying, what can we do on this unit to change the way we provide care? And the same holds for quality. We need everyone to actually share this ownership. In BC, we have 90 operating theatres across 24 hospitals who are committing to, committed to improving surgical care. We created a surgical quality action network to mobilize and support these sites. And they're engaged in the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program in a large-scale culture initiative. And as we started, we began to see examples where um, the surgery departments and the quality departments were both wanting to own this work. And what struck me is when we finally had surgical departments saying, um, what, what can we do, and saying to quality, no, this is ours to own, that was successful for us. That was a significant cultural shift. And it meant also that for quality departments, they had to let go and to move to that um, community development uh, perspective. True engage engagement and partnership, the other lesson that my experiences with my parents taught me is really critical in driving change. This purposeful action to create opportunities to move us outside of our comfort zones to make the magic happen. And we've been working through a top-enabled, bottom-driven bottom -driven approach that is looking to unleash the creative action at the front line. About four years ago, we began to incorporate a strategy called positive deviance. It's an approach to improvement that seeks out the deviant behaviors that have positive results within the system. We've partnered with several organizations to look at the value of PD on reducing MRSA, and we saw reductions in infection rates and also increase in uh, hand hygiene compliance. Positive deviance techniques, which incorporate tools and strategies known as liberating structures, result in high levels of engagement with providers, with administrators, with patients. We have discovery and action dialogues, wise crowds, improvs, all sorts of tools that really help uh, us to use these as a foundation in concert with other improvements. We know that large-scale change requires both strong tie and weak tie relationships, and our approaches to mobilizing and engaging stakeholders in change has really resulted in um, networks and call to actions that have engaged those strong ties that we have. But we recognized that we needed to create more weak tie relationships and to mobilize at a larger scale than we had in the past. So we looked into the community, we looked into those who have been passionate about driving change through environmental movements and others, and we've been starting to learn from them that we need to start to move this col collaboration online. We, so we are now becoming much more deliberate in bringing online the work we have traditionally done offline. And this has created new opportunities for change at scale. The explosion of tools and social media have provided us with new opportunities and conversations and interactions that wouldn't have occurred previously. So whether it was YouTube, Twitter, Flickr, SlideShare, and others, not only create stronger, strong tie relationships, but they've created new opportunities for developing and leveraging weak tie relationships. And they're changing the way we drive quality improvement in our province. Creating opportunities for conversations to occur supports learning. Um, at this forum during this talk, there's a lot of chatter going on through Twitter. Um, we've used Twitter walls, Storify, to capture and share these conversations. So uh, those who aren't in this room can also learn uh, what is happening. So that energizing and mobilizing and engaging others through distributed leadership has been and continues to be a key for our success. My passion and my purpose is tied to the experiences I had with my parents to seek opportunities for that meaningful engagement and partnership, not only with patients who want to be involved in their care, but also with providers. As the Lorex taught us, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And our responsibility as leaders of improvement is to create those opportunities for true and meaningful engagement. And while we continue to leverage all that we know around process improvement, and I think all the lessons that Jason shared with us, our experience with positive deviance and liberating structures and the tools of social media have shown us a new opportunity for collaboration. When I reflect back to my dad's experience, and it's been 20 years since he passed away from a hospital-acquired infection, I think we actually have a lot to celebrate. There's been significant change, but we still have a long way to go. 
So in working together as partners in care, as partners in improvement, we can create those mindset shifts, the energy and the passion that's required for success. And while we have the opportunity through having a clear, clear strategy for change, we also need to continuously reflect on the way in which we engage and create conversations and mobilize. And we have to be deliberate in our actions to give voice to all of those involved. Thank you. Um, Christina, that was wonderful. And just a couple of things I wanted to say about that. One of the things that we know is if we want to create large-scale change and we want to mobilise people to take action, the most effective way of, of doing that is linking to emotions. And the way we do that through values is through values. And I think that, you know, you role-modelled that um, so beautifully. And the second thing I wanted to say was that, actually, if I was um, to give the unofficial um, tweeter of the Forum Award... Um, I would give it to Christina. And I think that the way that she and her colleagues are using um, social media in British Columbia is a lesson to the world. And, and I aspire to and of my organisation to be as good as, good as you and your colleagues because it's tremendous. Whew. Okay, um, so we've had um, six down, two to go. Um, and um, we're, um, we're carrying on with our westward journey. And I'm really happy now to introduce Jane Evans. And Jane is from Victoria in Australia. Um, come on up, Jane. Is there anything you'd like to say before you start? No. No, okay. So ready, get going, right. Sounds like an executioner, doesn't it? It's like, you know. That's what it feels like. No. <laughs> So I'm Jane Evans and today I'm going to share a story of large scale change in Victoria. This is a story about a health system and a health service and the key lesson I've learnt along the way. The lesson is about culture and behaviour, the organisation and the individual and is one that for many of you is well known and actually obvious but my experience is that the obvious may not be so obvious after all. The story starts with the Victorian redesigning hospital care system which commenced in 2008 and as program manager I was tasked with building a system-wide redesign, uh, redesign capability to deliver measurable and sustainable improvement in service quality, cost and patient outcomes. Some system facts. We had $20 million in four years. There were 32 health services, including the ambulance service, 55 individual locations, a land size 7 per cent smaller than Britain, and the home of Ramsey Street and neighbours. The task was huge. The first question I ask myself before I start changing anything is what does success look like? How will I know when the system is capable of improving? Do I have the same picture of success as my boss, as the Minister for Health or as the health services? Will we have that, that bore at moment? So going back to basic simple measures of organisational and individual capability and performance were key. Where do you start to build a system capable of improving? We use some simple principles, investment in developing capability for the process of change, allowing health services to choose their improvement priorities, a medium-term perspective as well as realising goals in the short term, and coordination of improvement work. So what did we do? We gave health services funding to employ redesign lead whose job it was to develop and implement the program locally. We provided training and tools in improvement and measurement. We gave money to undertake redesign projects to learn by doing, and we developed collaborative relationships between health services to share ideas and to realise benefits at the system level. We also taught a range of improvement skills using a variety of approaches to a wide range of staff. We looked outside of health. One of our doctors spent two weeks making seat belts and learning lean principles firsthand. A visit to the craft factory where they make peanut butter provided us all with a very humbling experience about how to do hand hygiene. So did we deliver an improved system? Did the system change? A return on investment of between five and eight dollars for every dollar invested was used to treat more patients, resulting in an improvement of 20 per cent statewide in performance against the four-hour access, emergency access target. 14 per cent of all staff across the whole Victorian health system now have redesigned capability. My story now moves from the system to the health service. Following a challenging but rewarding three years, I recently took up the position leading redesign and performance excellence at Eastern Health. Effectively, I'm now working within the system that I had a hand in creating, and so I have the opportunity to see how it's worked or not worked. This role is also about leading large-scale change. Eastern Health provides acute, subacute, obstetrics, mental health, drug and alcohol, residential care and community health services out of more than 25 locations. The 8,000 staff deliver more than 800,000 episodes of care each year. 
it is large and complex too. Eastern Health is a great place to work. Organisational capability for redesign and improvement is relatively well developed. There is breadth and depth in improvement skills. Early localised improvement projects have moved to organisation-wide patient value streams of work. Is this a, the result of a system that is capable of improving? Eastern Health is a great place to work because it understands that sustainable long-term improvements in the quality of services and the cost at which they are delivered requires a focus on the organisation as a system and for it to be skilled in improvement and to continuously learn. Our performance excellence framework may appear simple, but it is a foundation for change. The language and skills of improvement and problem solving are well embedded at Eastern Health. This represents a huge shift in, from my experience at another health service only three years previously. But is this a shift due to the redesigning hospital care program or the culture of the health service? This is something we'll probably never be able to determine, but having common languages and practices across the whole state certainly helps ma maintain the momentum and capability. So back to my learning. Sustainable improvement of the health system of individual health services and of individuals requires that improvement is a core organisation behaviour that must be taught and learnt. This capability must be directed at both the organisation and the individual. These things are not the cherry on the top, but should be the organisation's way of being. Organisational capability explores the relationship between individuals and the organisational systems and strategic intent. Individual skills and knowledge combine with the organisation's systems and values to deliver the strategy. To make a human pyramid, every person needs to be trained in their role, to know the strategy and to work collectively to make the final structure. We learn every new skill through a combination of learning techniques. The theoretical and practical learning are equally important. I wouldn't get into a boxing ring without training and coaching specific skills and techniques required to box, particularly with somebody who looks like that. And yet we expect <laughs> nurses, managers, doctors, cleaners and CEOs to undertake improvement work without any training and wonder why it fails. These fairly basic concepts apply regardless of the application. Using the three ingredients of Im for improvement, will, ideas and execution, my husband created this award-winning landscape at the Taiwan Garden Expo. The concepts, simple as they are, are not well understood and applied in the majority of health services, and I wonder why is that? Because improvement is not considered as a core organisational capability. A leap of faith is required, along with some good data and a medium to long-term view, to demonstrate that improving process will improve the value of the healthcare services to the patients. It's like investing in a high-interest bank account. You need to invest up front to see the high returns in the future. In the 20 years that I have been doing and leading change, the biggest challenge is that improvement is seen as a department, same as Christina was saying, and, and rather than as a core of everybody's role or their job too. We know that only those who deliver the care can improve the care, but we don't explicitly teach those people how to do the improvement work. We just expect them to know how to do it. A learning and improving organisation just doesn't happen by magic. It takes a health service full of improvement-capable individuals working together in a structured way towards the same objectives. I'm lucky to work in a health service within a health system that understands this concept. It is no different than training as a team to learn how to get over obstacles that are seemingly impossible as individuals. Did I just state the obvious? Oh, another, I think another um, terrific presentation and again what I would pull out um, in terms of what Jane has just present, presented to us is the importance of that, that massive investment in capability building. If we look across the world of, of healthcare and those organisations that perform the best, the thing that we see time and time again is this, this real focus and investment in building, in building capability. So, so thank you, Jane. So I can't believe it's our very last speaker now. So um, where we're going now, we're, kind of, um, we're coming back eastward, I'd say, to, um, to Oregon in the USA. And um, I'm very pleased to introduce David Ford, who is the Chief Exec of Care Oregon. So um, David, come on up. And while I'm making your, just getting your presentation, is there anything you'd like to say before we start? Just that um, one of the axioms we all work on is um, we're hired to do the job we're hired to do, we're hired to change the job we're hired to do, but most important, we're hired to change ourselves to change the job we're hired to do. This is about changing yourself, um, not the system outwardly, but the transformation of one's organization to meet a new need. This is a mask 
of the Aboriginal people in British Columbia. We had the occasion when we went to do some work with Helen and um, Christina in uh, British Columbia to stop by the Museum of Anthropology. And we had the good fortune of having the curator talk to us about how they sacredly hold these objects. I was so moved, I thought that this is really about the work that we do as practitioners, the spiritual sacred trust of our work and the spiritual energy of vitality, passion toward the future and the sense of possibility. These are the people we serve. Uh, at Care Oregon, we have about 160,000 people who are poorest and there is some thought that in the US, the poor are even more uh, traumatized because we don't have the backup. This is a picture of, um, from Commonwealth Fund showing the U.S. costs compared to the, you guys. And we're 17 and need to develop world-class care and health outcomes at probably 10%. Facing us are the physics that uh, Oregon's cutting our rates about 14 to 16%, probably indefinitely. You're all experiencing some of this but it's very real for us starting August 1st. This is our governor, a physician, he was governor uh, eight years ago and is back. His passion is change, but he's given us a challenge that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Transform or die, kind of a dirty, hairy uh, comment. Uh, we're trying to transform. Uh, this green line is the drop toward the 10% and observing what you folks do around the world, you have a different mix between medical and social. So our big challenge is investing forward. We're putting $30 million into changing the structural pieces in our locale for our, the people that we serve. This is gonna mean a big disinvestment in the red areas and a invest forward in the green areas to reduce our cost and create a re investment cycle uh, and the, the fundamental piece of this is to do it through a lot of change but one of them is whole community coordinated care and the operative word is community in the US we haven't done that we've really based it on companies this is Eleanor Ostrom Nobel Prize winner who's spoken studied her whole career um, in systems uh, comments on the left side is equilibrium, disequilibrium. When you consume too much, you uh, ha have a distance from a sustainable point. And the organizational work we're doing now are to create health commons, we call them CCOs, uh, Coordinated Care Organizations, that mediate back to a sustainable point. So in Oregon, a lot of our work right now is co-building, and we use this word co intentionally through the Theory U piece, new community health containers. And these haven't been done before in our region. You have them in some places where we are co-custodians as a sacred trust. And that is, we don't own them. They belong to the people that um, are being served. And a lot of the t telephone calls I'm doing uh, late at night are about this uh, as we speak. Our governor has really said we're looking for in these coordinated care organizations uh, in new models. A term that I borrowed from the Canadians from speaking is community health democracies. Wonderful term. And we're dreaming that we can create a vitality uh, in this area. These are about six or seven regions that Care Oregon will engage in. It's a great Oregon experiment. We've done large scale social experiment in the past. But creating health democracy or what we call community commons of the people, by the people, for the people as Abraham Lincoln has spoken about in his Gettysburg Address. We're seeing our role as the enabler for that. We think we're being called to make this whole new idea work. And that's very transformative for us. In fact, we don't call it transformation. We really call it radical transformation. To move from a hierarchical kind of central organization to flipping us inside out and becoming a horizontal network. We call this um, <coughs> inter-independent, not interdependent. And it has fundamental change for us. So if we're going to be faced with 
supporting a number of community health networks that are self-governing, we're going to have to flip from this hierarchical to being an infrastructure support platform. And this is where the masks or the sacred trust work is. It's not for us, it's for them. We're transforming ourselves and creating an enterprise platform using the tools and learning that we have had over the years to creating the infrastructure capability to support these organizations. There are more than just these. We also have clinics and we also are starting a, a brand new cooperative. And to do that in such a way that preserves the values, the agility and the innovation that we've done for years. Uh, we call this the blue man and it's very visceral. Uh, moving from a self-contained model to an open shared model, radical inside uh, out. Uh, so we're changing from an old order in this next phase of our development to a new order. So when we go back to the masks, we're really talking about changing from being an ownership model to a, a sacred trust. So as we look at the pathway into the future and we go to our next generation of change, we're really saying it's of the people, by the people, for the people, and our pathway is fundamentally trust and courage because we can't fully see it. But everyone in the room is faced with this. What we do each and every day is sustain our sacred cultures of healing, and that's the work that I think that we share. Thank you. Oh, Dave, what a great way to end. And you know what I'd say is that what Dave has just shared with us is not just important for the people of Oregon or as a, um, I think, you know, looking across the USA and, and, and many of the health chair challenges there, but I'd also say it's important for the world. And, and what I also really take from what you said, you talked about, you know, the sacred culture of healing, the kind of spiritual dimension. And I think for all of us, you know, facing the kind of change challenges that we face, we've got to get into the spiritual domain. We've got to focus on values, on, on connectivity, on shared purpose, um, shared goals and, and hope and optimism and, and possibility together. So um, appreciate that very much. Wow. So weren't those eight amazing, amazing presentations? I'm just going to be <laughs> wonderful. So, so what we saw there, I think, were, were eight truly um, deviant people, but, but positive deviants. And, you know, all the time, like when I go around the system and we look at large-scale change, the reality is that most large-scale change fails to deliver. And yet what we've seen here, I think, are eight examples that, you know, um, where it has been delivered and is being delivered. And we should be full of hope and, and optimism and, and, and possibility um, for the future, all of us. I think we've, uh, we've seen um, the future here in the, in the last hour. And, you know, I take so many lessons um, from these eight presentations around what it takes um, to deliver large-scale change, you know, that is pervasive, that is of a big, um, big size and, um, and very deep. We can do it, and as healthcare improvement leaders, we, um, we have to do it. And, you know, Dave talked at the end there about trust and courage, and I really take my hat off to our eight speakers, because to come and do this when you've never done a Petra Kucha presentation before in front of um, 250 people, I think, took a, a lot of courage. And, um, and I you know, really appreciate, I think we all appreciated that you, you, um, you did that, and you did it um, absolutely brilliantly. So, so thank you to all our speakers. I'd also like to thank um, Rachel here, Rachel douglas Clark. Okay. So, um, Rachel works with me at the NHS Institute and um, I gave her the job in December um, when we knew we were going to be doing this session of, of pulling it together and can you imagine the job of coordinating nine people um, from across the world um, on, a, on a virtual basis and, um, and getting us all together so um, Rachel you've been tremendous and we couldn't have done this without you so, so thank you. Yeah. 
and I guess, you know, the biggest message I take from this is if we want to create large-scale transformational change, it, it, starts, um, it starts with each one of us. So, so thank you to you all for being part of this. Um, we've um, finished a little bit early, as planned. Okay? So what I wanted to say is we just had eight uh, tremendous examples there. So if any of you would, would like to stay and, and, um, and talk with some of our speakers and get a little bit more knowledge, we have got a little bit of time for, for, um, for doing that now. But thank you to, to you all for taking part in what I think is an amazing session. And go to your own local Petruchka night because it's tremendous. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.